do this so I can keep track of where I am. Awesome. Uh, so um, thanks for uh, showing up today. Uh, my name is Robinson Tryon. Um, I currently work for um, the Lot Network, uh, which is a entity um, nonprofit that helps deal with patent trolls. And I've worked um, in various other um, capabilities. Um, worked on LibreOffice. Worked. Um, on some neat uh, metadata, metadata games, collecting uh, information for archived, uh, for archives and libraries. Um, and um, I'm based in Dallas, Texas, which is lots of fun for giving talks about patents because the patent capital of the world in East Texas, uh, Marshall, Texas, is basically two hours due east of me. So this wasn't planned. I didn't. I moved there first and then got this job. So. Uh, for this presentation, um, I should probably keep a, a, a look at the time as well. Um, I, I wanted to kind of just uh, uh, look at what's going on with patents in the US and Europe, uh, talk about what's happening, and a lot of stuff is happening, a lot of amazing things are happening, um, and uh, keep all of you guys awake, but I'll cover your yawning, so uh, I'll have to work on that. And just talk about uh, patent strategy uh, for businesses. So um, I originally uh, had like a 20 minute talk, I think, and then I realized I had more time, so um, hopefully I did not uh, expand my slides too much. We'll see how I, <laughs> how I zoom through. So uh, I'm not a lawyer, um, not your lawyer, all the normal stuff applies. But hopefully you guys have a little familiar with law and patents. I'm going to sort of jump through things. Um, I know a couple of you guys are lawyers. Many of you lawyers at all? A couple? All right. So I do apologize if I say things or th things seem overly simple to you um, because I have wanted to sort of discuss some topics and talk about some things that uh, I learned about, I didn't know a lot about um, regarding um, legal issues um, in uh, the EU and in um, the United States. So let's begin. Um, when I started researching these systems, I, I didn't really understand the total impact of events and how that would affect patent systems and how that would affect litigation and so forth. So I sort of started as sort of a narrow review and that really expanded, that grew um, into looking at sort of the amazing change that um, administrative change um, a leader like a new president of the United States can have. So um, I found that very interesting and, and I hope that you guys will as well. So the crux of my talk I think was about preparing uh, free, and free and open source software companies uh, to deal with patents, to actually sort of give you guys uh, tidbit of uh, tidbits of information about how you can look at patent, uh, the patent sphere, you can look at litigation, and get a handle on what's going on and what's going to come next. Because I think that's really important to see what's going to come next, what the future of patents, um, the future of patentability is. Um, some patent strategies, some ways of dealing with patents are, of course, smarter than others. But um, what I found very interesting is that there are a lot of companies, a lot of startups out there who basically have no plan about dealing with patents. Um, whether they are startups in hardware or software, um, uh, it, it, hard, hardware more than, than software, but a large number of, of um, startups, uh, both in the free software space and not, um, that don't really think about patents. They sort of push it off. Um, and I think that's the wrong strategy. I think it's something that we need to think about early on um, so that we don't back ourselves into a corner, so that we um, have uh, ability to reduce our risk and to make smart decisions. So. Um, Educating yourself, of course, is the most important thing. Um, it doesn't hurt to educate yourself on legal systems beyond your own. I remember when I learned French for the first time, I had no idea what the imperfect was. I had no idea what these other things were. I used it in English. <laughs> I used it concepts. Uh, but it was by learning other systems, by being able to compare and contrast, that then you can actually have uh, a greater understanding of your system. So slings and arrows. Um, so one really interesting uh, lawsuit that I thought was a, was a great place to start in terms of litigation is there was a guy in a uh, pastor uh, who liked to LARP. He liked to shoot people with arrows. And uh, these were foam-tipped arrows, right? So it was you know, no, no death. Uh, but he started selling these things online. And he expanded his business, and he started to import arrows from, as it turns out, a European country. So uh, we have this uh, US and, 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 and Europe uh, already involved here. So there was a, uh, a company that sued him for patent and trademark infringement because they wanted to make sure they got everything. Um, and they claimed, claimed that the errors he was selling uh, infringed on patents that they had filed for their own hardware, for their own, for their own um, uh, game, error, error game. Um, and they told him, probably with a little bit of bragging and hopefully to scare him, that they had set aside $150,000 to um, 
And he was definitely intimidated by that. So he didn't really have any money. Um, he was, uh, again, he was a pastor, youth pastor, uh, didn't have a lot of money. So he turned to GoFundMe and um, asked others in, the, in his community, which could be very similar to, say, the free and open source software community, to help him defend against this um, particular case. Um, and in response to that, um, Global Archery, this company, tried to get a gag order to stop him from talking about this. So basically, they you know, kind of ratcheted things up, and thankfully, they were unsuccessful. Um, what, was, what really was great for him uh, was that after the suit came out, um, Newegg, who is a very, <laughs> a very strong stance against patent trolls, um, stepped forward to help him. And in fact, they had been selling these t-shirts, um, uh, Troll Hunter t-shirts, and they <laughs> set aside $10,000 from that to help him, to, for, him for his, uh, for his uh, lawsuit, uh, to, defend, to defend against this uh, patent troll uh, lawsuit. Uh, so uh, Newegg, um, Li Cheng, um, is uh, chief counsel there. And in fact, Newegg and Li Cheng are involved in um, the Lot Network as well, who I work for, um, again with patent trolls. Um, Cheng basically said, and he, he went a little further than, than I might have, he said that this company, even though they sell products, he said, you know, they're, they're basically a troll because they're asserting questionable IP, um, they're aggressive, and uh, he went on and on, you can read. But, he basically laid into them. And um, what, was, what was really important, I think, about this is that um, after Chang and Newegg signed on as this sort of champion, um, Global dropped its case. Global finally acknowledged there was prior art uh, from Germany uh, that, that had been created in the past. And um, they basically dropped the, the lawsuit. In fact, they not only dropped the lawsuit, they, uh, they basically um, they immediately dropped the lawsuit to basically avoid having their own IP invalidated. So they kind of did a really quick shuffle. So what I think was really important about this case, even though it's not about freedom or software, it's in a slightly different realm, is that not everyone has a champion. So in different spheres, not everyone has a champion, which means that you will, it's important for you to set yourself up for success. It's important for you to have a patent policy. Um, and whether that's making friends, whether that's uh, joining a, a, a group like the Lot Network, Open Invention Network, you should have a, a patent policy and an IP policy um, the sooner the better. So, you know, what, what I thought was especially interesting, even though he had strong prior art, um, he was unable to, to shake the lawsuit because he wasn't a lawyer, he didn't have that background. So, don't overestimate a wealthy plaintiff. Um, people have big war chests. So, uh, I, with that in mind, thinking about the little guy, the big guy, um, I want to kind of look at um, the European Union um, and US patent systems and think about what, what courts look like in the future, um, what relationships will exist between countries, um, and so forth. So um, the UPC, do you guys call that a UPC in Europe as well? OK, good. I saw that. <laughs> when I first heard UPC, it, it kept on running in me, so I, I had to throw in there. Uh, it's a proposed court open to all members of the EU, but it's not a part of the EU. I was a little confused about that. Uh, but um, it was important to look at this because basically the UPC, um, as I understand it, would supersede a lot of the other courts. It would collect all of the uh, patent cases, especially software patent cases, uh, into one court uh, that would apply to all these European Union member countries um, and deal with infringement, um, and as well as this idea about unitary patents. So kind of like a you know, pan-European file at once, uh, run everywhere, Java, I think. Java patent, maybe? <laughs> But um, uh, there was a great talk last year. If you guys want to learn more about it, um, please take a look at that. Here's really quickly some concerns that, um, that were raised last year about it and I think are still relevant. It's a pro-patent court, um, as he claimed, basically because the, all they would do is patents, so we sort of get into their brain. Um, there are similar claims made for a court in the United States, um, a court of appeals to the Federal Circuit. All they do is patents, not all they do is patents, but largely they um, engage with a lot of patent work, and so therefore patents on the brain. Um, some other issues. There's no uh, appeals court. So in the United States, there's a court, the Supreme Court of the United States, that reviews these other courts' um, decisions and hopefully injects some sanity, basically, to those who deal with patents all the time. There's nothing to, to override that. Um, uh, there's a pro-software patent tradition from Germany. Um, and it's independent from the EU, which makes it a little bit weird. And um, uh, patents are only translated into a few languages. So. Uh, Basically, in, in, you know, we, we could go through these individually, but basically what this sums up to is that the UPC will be uh, a very um, uh, unfriendly place um, for dealing with patents, especially software patents. Um, and I think that uh, if, if uh, enacted, would be a very um, uh, unhealthy uh, development for free software. 
But I guess thankfully, uh, it doesn't exist yet. Um, basically, the UK and Germany both have to sign, and then the Brexit happened. So <laughs> what does the Brexit mean? This is very interesting. And again, one of the lawyers out there might wave your hand insistently. That's great. You can correct me. But as I understand, one of the problems is that basically the Brexit right now, in short term, won't have any major uh, impacts on patents in, in uh, the European Union. But after the UK leaves the EU, it won't be under the jurisdiction of the EU courts. And it can't be a member of the proposed UPC. But for the UPC to exist, it needs to have Britain and needs to have Germany ratify it. So this is an issue <laughs> that's going on right now. So in fact, the UK, who theoretically is leaving, said, we're going we're gonna to leave. Don't worry. But we're going to ratify this first. So that, that's cool. Right? They're going to ratify it, and then they leave. But the problem with that is that the UPC um, is designed, and I might be jumping ahead here for a second, uh, but basically, so the UK said, yes, you know, as long as we're members of the EU, we're going to participate. We're going to be a, a part of this. But the issue with this is that the UPC is supposed to be only EU members. So if Britain signs on to it and then they leave, then they're a part of the UPC, but they can't be a part of the UPC. This is very confusing. So for me, some scholars have said there's a convoluted way around this. Well, to sort of summarize that, that means for anybody else who has to deal with patents, so anyone else who has to deal with these courts or has to try to make some type of uh, patent strategy for the future, um, it's very impenetrable. It's very difficult. So in essence, this is one more reason why having a patent strategy, um, having at least a lawyer you can talk to to give you some advice in these uh, situations is very important. I'm sure that this is going to change in the next few months um, continually. Of course, many people in the UK uh, kind of like the idea of leaving without joining the UPC because it is um, ostensibly such a pro software patent court. So um, what would happen in the UK without um, the UPC? Um, uh, basically, um, my understanding is that uh, it would be a little bit more free software friendly. Basically, the UK has a slightly smaller scope of patentability than what is currently present. So summarize basically that, it would be a little bit better for free software um, in Britain. So in the United States, this, this, one, this part is exciting. So um, what's going on? Un, under Obama, um, there was the American Invents Act. Um, there were some really great parts, um, uh, parts of that act that enabled people to um, work on uh, sort of uh, getting rid of bad patents before they were, um, while they were being filed. So any of you guys involved with Linux Defenders? Any, any of you guys involved with basically getting rid of these uh, patents? No? OK, so uh, basically, it was working with prior art. It was basically a way in which um, various uh, members of the community, with legal background often, but not necessarily, could help to um, basically tell the patent office, hey, this is a bad patent. Hey, there's prior art. So this is definitely, I think, something that companies should think about, um, especially if they're operating a certain space, databases, virtualization, et cetera. Um, this is something that is, it is really important. I'm uh, not sure if there's something uh, parallel um, in Europe right now, but it would be great to have an ability for someone to say, hey, someone's trying to file a patent on XYZ, um, and we have you know, XYY. It's really close to that. And this is something that should be reviewed. So that's something that should be a part of your patent strategy. Um, what can we expect under Trump? So there wasn't really much information under Trump. It's kind of uh, exciting. Um, IP wasn't a primary focus. Um, everyone online, um, all of the articles I've been reading, um, the research I've done, says everyone is excited about writing articles about it, but they really don't know. They just like to talk a lot. So, um, so what do we do know? Um, his, he had an uncle, actually. Um, it was interestingly who won a Presidential Medal of Freedom, who was an inventor at MIT and did a lot of really neat stuff. So um, he had a cool uncle, so we can be, we can be happy about that. Uh, he's criticized some companies, and because of his business and, um, and his behavior, I think that in the United States we're going to see a, a policy um, emerge that's going to be uh, more patent friendly, more lit uh, you know, friend litigious friendly. Um, and probably about the only thing I'm certain about in this presentation, he's going to tweet about it. So, <laughs> um, so who's, in, who's in charge in the United States? Um, there's currently someone called Michelle Lee. She's important, appointed under Obama. Um, Peter Thiel, if anyone knows who he is, she actually went to Stanford Law at the same time. Um, so I love all these interesting connections, people um, in the same classes um, in, at the same time. So uh, she has been um, active, actually. Um, there's rumors that she's staying on. 
but it's very unclear right now. Um, she was previously working at Google, and she pushed for a lot of patent reform. So probably the lawyers in here know what some of these things are. Um, the rest of you, Google is your friend. Um, interesting things. Uh, she worked on enhancing patent quality, this enhanced patent quality initiative, um, which was was great one time when basically there was an acknowledgement that poor quality patents had come out of the patent office. Um, she implemented this inter-parties review, which helped to deal with trolls, um, was, in, in, um, was hoped to be a uh, better way, a cheaper, more accurate way to um, uh, deal with um, patent quality, um, uh, deal with patents. Um, rather than having a hearing about them. And she even floated the idea of putting them to forum shopping. So what I mentioned about the, the um, Eastern Texas um, court, which some of you might be familiar with, where all the patent troll activity happens in the United States, um, she was hopefully going to put an end to that. So um, largely, I would say she was a friend to, to free software. Um, it's unclear if she's going to continue as director. It's all a big question mark which isn't a huge surprise in, in, uh, under Trump's uh, presidency. Um, but um, we, are, we are awaiting. So, so who might replace her? So this is sort of the kicker, I think. Um, Philip Johnson possibly could replace her. He was someone who Trump vetted. Um, uh, not sorry, not Trump, Obama vetted. Um, but tech companies didn't like him. And if, if he or someone like him were to um, become the head of the patent office, this could have a huge impact on uh, patents in the United States. Um, you can, you can see here he criticized legislation um, that would require details about patent infringement. He opposed transparency requirements. Um, and uh, he, he basically wanted uh, you know, less, less regulation. So um, this could be a, this could be a, a big change um, in, 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 in a step backwards, a lot of people would say, um, the way patents are handled in the United States. So, um, so the cost of a patent troll suit. Um, so, if you've ever been sued by a patent troll, I apologize. Um, and hopefully that you got through it <laughs> pretty much unscathed. If you were a small company, you probably didn't survive. Um, you can think, you know, 3.3 million. Um, I just was talking to my cousin um, who has a small startup, and I'm pretty sure that that is about at least three times <laughs> the money they currently have in the bank. Um, so basically, patent, patent lawsuits, this is in the United States, um, where most of my numbers, um, usually costs about one half a million um, in, in legal fees, and then a little bit more in, in license costs, or basically if you have to pay off um, um, you, you know, this troll. Um, unfortunately, in these troll cases, uh, small companies bear a large amount of the money. And it, and it makes sense, I mean, you know, in a crude, crude way, not in a good way, but basically patent trolls go after the weak of the flock, right? And who's the weak of the flock? It's going to be the young, the startups, and so forth, um, which, is, which is unfortunate, but um, it's a, it's a predator-prey relationship. So if you work in hardware, um, hopefully you guys don't. Um, you're going to pay a lot more. Licensing can be many millions, eight million, for example. That's an average, right? It could be, could be much higher. Um, so um, on the, in the realm of hardware, um, Basically, there, there are uh, a lot of other places where patents can be regulated in the United States, and one is in the FTC, um, the Federal Trade Commission. So uh, just before Trump took office, the FTC sued uh, Qualcomm, um, accusing them of unfair competition, um, claiming they violated FRAN licensing, um, that they basically were bundling um, hardware and patent licenses um, exclusively, and uh, had some exclusive deals with Apple. And uh, the... Uh, this is something the FTC does. Again, like the United States Patent Office, um, it is uh, part of uh, what they do in terms of, in terms of regulating trade. But um, a lot of people are very concerned because this, uh, this review could have had a big impact on how hardware companies uh, regulate, how hardware companies uh, sell their products, how they might bundle patent licenses with hardware, for example, something that is of great concern to the free software community. Um, Qualcomm <laughs> found this. <laughs> it's really amusing. Uh, Qualcomm announced uh, an open source subsidiary in 2009. Um, and if any of you guys have, uh, know about and a lot about Qualcomm, um, if you don't, and this is, I, I think, kind of telling, CNET proudly proclaimed, Qualcomm gets into open source and pigs begin to fly. So uh, basically, not a big fan, um, historically, of open source uh, free software. So um, what might happen under Trump? Under Trump? Um, so a, a lot of people have asked, um, a lot of conservative groups have asked Trump to stop the FTC's action. And the effect that could have, sort of the knock-on effect, um, is that, you know, 
it could, it could basically change how uh, we see uh, antitrust, uh, um, basically fair trade, thing, uh, fair trade happening in the United States, um, which could affect a lot of free software companies. So the FTC decided to file the suit, broke down on party lines, basically. Um, and the, person, the uh, chair you can see there who voted um, for this um, resigned in February. Um, and I, actually, I'm not sure she's, she's resigned yet. She's going to resign in a, in a couple of days. Uh, the Lone Center has been appointed the chair of the FTC. And um, with this change, it's quite likely the FTC excuse me, um, will give more broad permission to companies like Qualcomm to uh, basically increase their, uh, their, their patent litigation. Uh, Olhausen, excuse me, um, is, uh, is critical of net neutrality um, and of regulation in general. I think this is sort of a common thread that we're going to see um, throughout change in the administration. Um, regarding um, Obama's FTC, um, excuse me, uh, she said it was one that pursued an antitrust agenda, that dis disregarded sound economics, um, basically made unsupported assertions of unfair competition. So um, basically, she, she's expected to give Qual <coughs> excuse me, Qualcomm <coughs> excuse me, uh, more flexibility um, and how it capitalizes on its assets. So she also discussed um, uh, PAEs, or patent trolls, um, in her talk. Um, and she said that uh, Patent, these patent trolls have become the boogeyman of the patent world. Um, and she worried that patent form would have harmed US innovation. So it's unclear what action she's going to take about patent trolls. But basically, um, it's highly unlikely for freedom source software companies um, to see meaningful patent reform over the next four years. Reducing risk. So excuse me. Um, no matter who you are as a company, no matter um, who you're working for, um, and whatever your, the size of your holdings, um, any company can be seriously challenged by a patent suit. We've seen this happen with um, Google and Oracle. We've seen this happen with um, Apple um, and, and, and lawsuits it's faced in several times over the last few years. So no patent strategy is bulletproof, but there are many approaches to reducing risk. So uh, one, which uh, I, I find kind of novel, but I think is good as sort of a baseline thought process, is that patent trolls, if we look at patent trolls themselves, they don't produce goods, they don't sell services, and they don't participate in collaborative behaviors. And by doing this, they basically have no surface to sue. There's, no, there's no, nothing to go after. So uh, most companies do, in fact, need to produce goods or services to stay in business. But um, avoiding certain activities, or at least thinking about what activities um, might be the most likely target for a troll or for patent litigation, is a useful exercise when you're developing patent strategy. And that can reduce your risk. Um, there are a number of entities, um, a number of groups, as I mentioned, the Open Invention Network, I think several of you are familiar with them, uh, that can reduce your risk um, in patent litigation. Um, the Lot Network, who I work for, um, is a collaborative solution to dealing with patent trolls, can also reduce your patent risk. And um, the Open Patent Office is Frederick Quistia here. Hello. So he has a, uh, I want to throw this in here because I saw it on the, uh, on the uh, slate. His talk is coming up next. So um, he'll give you a, a talk about this um, right, right afterwards. So stick around um, and you can learn a bit more about um, how this is an alternative to uh, traditional patent office. May could work out well as part of your patent strategy. Um, there are a lot of other strategies. Uh, the EFF uh, created a document called the Hacking Patent System, a uh, guide to alternative patent licensing for innovators. I'm not sure what happened with that. I think maybe the uh, um, HTML, that's a, that's a hyperlink there, and I might have knocked out my last bullet point. But um, this is a, a guide. I think it's a couple of years old. Um, but it talks about a lot of different um, groups that are either um, a patent pool, um, uh, a patent grant entity, um, a alternative to traditional patent licensing, for example. So there are a lot of different uh, strategies. You can just um, probably look on the EFF website for that um, document. And we'll give you a lot of different um, types of groups or strategies you could use to shape a, um, uh, your patent strategy for your freedom or open source software business. So I wanted to look at uh, just one more patent uh, suit that I thought was instructive, that was interesting in the, uh, pertaining to freedom source software. So uh, CRISPR um, 
how many of you guys are familiar with biotechnology and CRISPR? Have you heard about CRISPR? A few of you? So it's, it's basically this technique in, bio, in biotechnology um, that allows people to manipulate DNA. So there is basically a significant dispute, all you need to know, um, over which researchers who were um, the originators of this technique and then who should have control of the patents vital to this. And this is big business. This is tens of billions of dollars um, of business here. So Harvard University and the Broad Institute are duking it out with Berkeley University. And if you guys know, uh, Harvard is on the East Coast and Berkeley is on the West. So it's kind of got this East-West side feud. Um, you can see uh, Harvard, the last couple of years, has spent $15 million. Uh, dollar, dollars. And Berkeley's spent over $5 million. I think it's closer to seven now. Um, and we're not even close to being uh, done with this suit. So average cost for a lawsuit like this um, is estimated about, about $7 million. So you can tell that this lawsuit has been much more expensive than previous ones. What I think was really interesting about this case, so it's a biotech um, patent, a series of biotech patents, um, and deals with, uh, deals with this technology, is that CRISPR is a tool for editing and rewriting DNA. So it can allow people to start to um, program at a very coarse level DNA, the genetic code. And why I think this is really important to us is that we're at this infancy with biotech manipulation. So right now, we have to deal with hardware patents and software patents that might affect what we do as free software companies. Uh, and um, uh, there are a lot of changes happening with uh, software patents. Hardware patents are a little more stable right now. Um, but it's something that affects what businesses can uh, exist, how businesses um, can um, innovate, um, how they can protect their, um, their inventions, um, and what free software can do in that space. So we've already started to see computer integration with human bodies. Um, you know, pacemakers, insulin pumps, um, other integration. But in the future, we're going to see microscopic changes, right? We're going to see people hacking on the DNA inside our bodies. So the real question on my mind in terms of patent preparedness, in terms of free software companies taking an active part in um, the forefront, essentially, of freedom um, in, in uh, programming and so forth, are we prepared to, to safeguard this? Are we prepared to be an active member in that? And I think the answer is not yet. So I think we need to become prepared very soon because this is sort of one of the next avenues for free software, for genetic freedom, if you will. Um, and it's something that we need to have in our minds going forward so that we can make um, smart decisions. The reality is there's, there's no one-size-fits-all strategy dealing with patents. Um, FOSS companies need to prepare for your individual patent battles, um, your individual cases, but you also need to think about larger patent-related topics, um, especially ones like sort of genetic programming uh, that have ethical and economic ramifications. Um, I think that it is uh, incumbent, essentially, on us because of the thought that we put into our businesses, the thought that we put into um, our strategies of how we design our businesses and the ethics of what we do um, with hardware and software, that it's important for us to think about the future and think about what um, important um, topics we need to stress and we need to um, bring to the forefront, talk with politicians, um, talk with our um, patent courts, and so forth. Um, most false companies don't have large legal departments. They don't have a large budget. But learning about the pertinent systems, learning about uh, technologies is really the only strategy um, that will bring you long-term success. So any questions? Excellent. And back there? Oh, should I give you a? Oh, OK. <laughs> Just run on. Hello. So um, the whole idea of patents made me a bit sick. But um, okay. the, the, the idea that I would like to take from here is, should I try to patent uh, the software and then pull it in a patent pool, or just ignore my, my or just ignore that and continue pushing to GitHub as normal? Yeah, I mean, if those are the two options, yeah. then I would say um, uh, consider filing the patent, although it's expensive. So uh, I, I think there are a lot of, there are a lot more options than that, right? So um, I think that. Um, this idea about the open patent, the next talk. Are you, are you put up to this? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I think that there are a lot of other options. Um, there are a lot of uh, companies um, that will make 
um, public disclosures, right? Or um, the um, there are um, yeah several mechanisms essentially where you can basically file these defensive publications um, to basically describe. And I, I think uh, several of them are, are in some ways describing like a patent. They describe a system, a mechanism, so forth, um, where you could basically uh, deed something to um, the public domain, the commons, um, and that's probably at least a, a cheaper way <laughs> going forward. Um, but um, but you don't get your name on a patent, so you know. Maybe you file one patent and then and then you have your name on a patent. <laughs> Anyone else right there? And. I, so, so I sell license exceptions to GPL uh -huh. as, as a business, um, and I deal with mostly U.S. and German companies, the two biggest customers. Uh -huh. But only the U.S. actually ever requested things like indemnification, not the German. So, what are your thoughts on on that? And sometimes I have a bang around indemnifications with uh, Andrew Katz. Uh, uh -huh. my uh, outside legal counsel um, and then I pay eventually sometimes if it's big enough I just charge them more and then I give up and give them the indemnification so uh, I don't know whether that's a good strategy or not what are your thoughts on indemnification um, I, I don't really have a, a big background on indemnification with, with GPL um, I feel like uh, that might be a, a question for Richard or just <laughs> someone of his ilk um, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that but um, I, I, I think it's an, it's, an in, it's interesting, but um, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know a lot about it, uh, honestly. Um, so, um, but wh what, I, what I would ask you is, um, I mean, is it, um, is, it, is it a booming business for you? You know, is it something that is, yeah. So, I mean, if, if, there's, a, if there's a large uh, business right there, if it's, it's something with, uh, with a lot of money involved, then I think that it's, it's something pertinent we should, you know. It should be discussed, right? I mean, we need to discuss those bigger, those bigger topics, especially things with big dollar um, numbers attached to them. So, excellent. In the back there, we need to, we need to have like a, like a volleyball, like a soft volleyball that you put the mic in and you throw to somebody. Hey. Jo Josh has a solution. Did they, oh, I was going to patent it. It was. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. Hi there. It's, it's not so much a question, although sure. I suppose it, it is in a way. Um, uh, it's been a long time since I've studied the EPC, but as I recall, um, the EPC more recently included very specific provisions in connection with biotech patenting. Um, I, as I recall, a number of them came out of the Oncomouse um, debacle. So I would think that the realm, shall we say, of patenting in connection with biotech inventions is probably, po or possibly even, more fuss oriented in so far as it's more difficult or more restricted to obtain biotech in the, uh, patents under the EPC than, for, for example, software related ones. Oh, interesting. Okay. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with that, and then biotech is also not my <laughs> field, so it's, it's a couple of bacons away, um, but uh, right there. Um, so just a, just a comment, really. Sure. Um, there are organizations in the United States, uh, intellectual property organizations, particularly the Intellectual Property Owners Association and the American Intellectual Property Law Association, sure. that are absolutely horrified with the um, Section 101 in the United States, which is the one that's invoked for not patentable subject matter. Sure. And they're working vigorously to reverse the Alice decision and then the Myriad decision. So I just wanted to point out that there is a huge um, constituency of largely of patent lawyers and patent owning companies that are working vigorously to sort of reverse the um, the advantages sure. of the uh, of the interpretation of patents that have been advantageous to FOSS, but there's a very large constituency working against that. Sure. Yeah. And I, I guess one thing that that I find interesting, and maybe it's partially the nature of software patents, it's partially the nature of um, uh, how patents uh, apply to this space that um, what seems like sometimes you know very small movements on the dial can have a very large impact um, whereas in other spaces it um, it seems like things are much more grain they're much more coarse um, but um, minute changes can <laughs> yeah can have a, a huge impact on on such a, um, a vast amount of economic space 
So uh, I'd like to follow up with you on that, Pam. Are you suggesting that these organizations are trying to, to solidify Section 101 machine or transformation test to, to like validate that for software? Yes, the, and, and the IPO uh, just recently came out with a public, uh, I believe someone can help me out maybe here, was it a draft statute? Um, some draft language that they wanted in order to make 101 apply back again to software patents or to sort of reverse the effect of Alice and Myriad. So um, the IPO has come out with a statement, AIPLA is working on one right now and I expect we'll have it come out shortly. Oh, give them a dislike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, but, you, but remember how powerful their voice is. Sure. These are the most powerful players sure. Sure. are coming out of these statements. Sure. Uh, at a certain point in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, and you suggested to avoid uh, patentable activities as far as possible. But what do you actually mean by patentable activities? Also, because if if you're a company trying to innovate and compete, even if you're sure. a free software company, you do have to do innovation. And and it, I mean, while some part of what you do is in your free software business, let's say, and you will give it freely, you might have other parts of, your, of what you do which are commercial, and you have to defend from your competitors to be able to finance. Oh, it. so oh, certainly, yeah. And as I said. I, you know, I, I feel like I could maybe have, have written that slide better. I kind of, you know, um, my thinking there was it was kind of like you know thinking like the wolf. But um, basically, the, um, the patent trolls. Uh, I've been intrigued. You know, it's like looking at a. Um, uh, I need to stand away from from something there. Uh, it seems like basically. Um, uh, patent trolls are, are uh, very slippery, right? They're, they're very good at basically um, having no um, surface which one can use to litigate against them. So what, in, in that sense, what I was saying was, um, it was we could learn from them, um, not necessarily by following their footsteps, per se, but learn from um, what they do um, to make themselves uh, have uh, less of a surface for, um, for uh, being, having litigation. And, and obviously, you know, if you want to innovate in space, and you should, um, then you can, may better understand what your, um, your risk is, right? What your likelihood of being sued is. And uh, there are a lot of different entities, whether that's, um, I mean, you know, uh, purchasing some kind of insurance, whether that's joining um, a patent pool and so forth to reduce your, your risk in that area. But I think that um, from sort of fundamental level, s starting with the idea of, um, yeah, what is patentable? What will, um, what will, uh, what is most likely for someone uh, to seize upon and sue you for, for what actions? I think that that should be a part of the equation um, in, your, in your mental calculus. So. Excellent. Any more questions, comments? Is everyone still awake? I'm impressed. I probably wouldn't be. As <laughs> oh. No, if there's no one else, I, I still have a second question, yeah. which is, I mean, you mostly focused on patent roles, but one of the reasons why you may want to patent or build your patent portfolio, even if you are a free software company, is that you have commercial competitors that have been ruthlessly sure. patenting everything and might use that to actually bully you in court, so you might want to have some other patents related to your same field and try to negotiate something. So would that be may sure. make sense? And I mean, that would, does that change yeah. anything in your, I mean, if you're not again, going again, I mean, being harassed by a patent role, but by a competitor? Sure, sure. And that's, it's a, it's a good question. Um, in, in my experience, a lot of companies working in um, the free software space and open source space um, don't seek uh, those kinds of patents. Instead, they seek relationships with um, entities that do have patents, or maybe they seek a few of them, but um, that, that in essence they, um, they try to participate in the sphere of, of um, uh, what is patentable and, and, and dealing with, um, with patents um, by not being as involved in that space um, and, and seeking other ways um, to, to reduce their, their risk or reduce their chances of being sued. So. Hopefully that, that answers your question. So. Anybody else? A dying question, a thought. Okay, great. Thanks, Robertson. Yeah, thank you, guys.